Hi everybody, Hank Linderman here, uh, coming at you from the very windy Falls of Rough, Kentucky. It's 3.30 p.m. Central, 4.30 Eastern, and I'm really happy to have you all here. Uh, as always, this is getting angry, and we've all got plenty of reason to be angry these days. Now, we don't want to act like damn fools. We want to be able to use our anger as a mechanism to focus us. What did uh, Colin Powell said? He said, get angry, and then get over it, and let's now get to work. So we understand everybody being angry. Um, anyway, I'm your Democratic nominee for Congress here in the Kentucky's second district. Hi, how are you doing, Nancy? And uh, it is such a windy day that uh, it's, it's very noisy. I'm sure you can hear the, um, you might be able to hear the wind chimes going nuts. Uh, Bill McNichol is here. Bill helps with our social media outreach, and it really makes a massive, massive difference if you all will share this broadcast. We're calling it that. So it makes it sound more important than it is, maybe. But really, we've got a message that we want to share, and that is that um, we really have a lot of work to do here in America, and especially in rural America. And that's why I'm here. I'm running for Congress in a district that's been uh, honestly let go, really by both parties. Uh, we've allowed this district to stagnate. We've allowed wages to stagnate. We've allowed business to just drip away we've been taken advantage of here, and we need to do a better job in places like the second district. By the way, the second district is the home of the Everly Brothers, it's the home of the Corvette, it's the home of Fort Knox, it's the home of Bourbon, it's the home of Bluegrass. Now, some might argue about that, but they are wrong. And it's also the birthplace of Abraham Lincoln. So this is a fantastic district, and um, here at Falls of Rough, it's just a lovely place. Uh, Nancy's having lots of rain. Uh, Mary says hi. Hi, Mary. Um, we played music. We we're doing music on Mondays. So I, I think what we're going to do on Fridays is I'm going to do a speech on Fridays. And I just worked on one today. It's why I'm a little bit late and why my hair looks like a mess. But I worked on a speech called The Seesaw. Do you all remember The Seesaw when you went to school? That was one of my favorite things was The Seesaw. So I've written a speech about that, so maybe I'll share that with you all on Friday and get your comments on it. Uh, Don and Phil, exactly, the Everly Brothers. Well, let's go look at our daily uh, concerns. Uh, unhappy. It turns out that Americans are the unhappiest they have been in 50 years. Hey Roy, how are you? Uh, there's a lot of reasons for this, and I believe that this poll was taken, sorry about all the wind, I believe this poll was taken before the George, George Floyd murders and before the civil unrest that's occurred since then. We've got a couple of charts here for you to look at. This is, of course, from the AP, the Associated Press. Uh, what do you think your children's standard of living will be? Will it be about the same or worse? And those who think it's going to be better... Um, oh, hi, Bo. I'm glad you're here. Uh, those of you those of us who thought that maybe our children's lives would be better have dropped off really since 2018 and that uh, we're seeing that it'll be about the same or those who think it'll be much worse that those numbers are rising here's more about unhappiness uh, we're also i guess primarily due to the pandemic we're more likely to be feeling lonely you know you can't reach out and hug someone which we used to do just all the time. You can't shake someone's hand. You can't just be close to someone for fear of giving or getting this dreadful disease that we're not even close to finishing with. And it is what it is. And, you know, for those of you that know um, my wife, uh, you know, you know that Pam cannot be in Kentucky during the winter because she has had several rounds of uh, pneumonia in her past. And so she's best off not being in very cold weather, so she stays in California during the winter. Normally she would be here, but because of the coronavirus, she can't travel, and because of the coronavirus, we're just not, we don't know when we will be together. So I'm here doing this, running for office, and believe me, it gets lonely, but uh, 
some of that is a phase and some of it just is what it is and we all have to deal with some of the difficulties of this but let's not misunderstand hi mark andes i'm glad you're here um let's not misunderstand you know the health of our loved ones and our friends and our neighbors is paramount and it does turn out from what we're seeing that uh, wearing masks is a critical critical piece hi Bar barbara how are you uh, we're okay, by the way. Pam and I are okay. We talk every day, at least once. We're doing okay. It's good. Um, now, early on, I called for COVID care for all. And be part of that is because our system is not really set up to provide health care to all of us the way we might want. I mean, a, a huge amount of us go without health care. Something like 35 million don't have any insurance and another 44 million have insurance that's so weak that they may as well not have insurance. And so the expense of COVID care is something that's on all of our minds. And this is the story here on The Guardian that uh, someone sent to me. It's I guess it's from today. A $1.1 million hospital bill after surviving the coronavirus, that's America for you. Now, I don't know if the person who's writing this is English, but a friend of mine in England is the one who sent this to me. So let's look at some of the text here. Now, this is a story about Michael Floor. He, th he thought he couldn't be shocked by much else. He'd survived a battle with the deadly virus, but he's 70 years old. He was hit with an incomprehensible hospital bill for his stay, $1.1 million, almost $10,000 a day for intensive care nearly $409,000 for its transformation into a sterile room for 42 days, $82,000 for the use of a ventilator, $100,000 for two days. These are just, I mean, how do, you, how do you even accept this? What are you supposed to do with a million dollar bill? Now, Medicare is gonna pick up his bill. And this, he's not the only person this has happened to. I mean, here's a woman in New York, a 33-year-old, uh, her medical bills started to pile up. They, an invoice for $485,000.57. You know, I wonder what the 57 cents was for. Now, they reduced the bill as a financial assistance benefit, but still 75 grand. She can't, this woman can't walk or find work. So she's hoping her insurance company is going to cover her. And Federal funding is supposed to cover the vast majority of our COVID bills. And I think, I'm trying to remember who it was. I believe it was Katie Porter, who's a representative from Orange County in California. And she got the Health and Human Services Director, uh, uh, got him to say, yes, all medical expenses should be covered. Um, but clearly that's not quite happening. And that's because the basis of our healthcare system is profit. One of the things that we need to address. Uh, I like this text. More importantly, it shouldn't take a once in a century pandemic to make policymakers understand the tragic absurdity of health care in the United States of America. Every day people encounter metal crises, medical crises that alter the trajectories of their lives. If it's not coronavirus, it's cancer or diabetes or broken bone. Every person in pain deserves the dignity of life without medical bills. And that's certainly the case. Apologies for the hair. You can it's, uh, think of it as a weather vane. The wind is going. Hi, Randell, I'm glad you're here. Glennis, I'm glad you're here too. Uh, this is the, one of the problems we face with our medical system. It's not really prepared to deal with um, a problem like a pandemic. And we saw that not just in our medical system, but our government's not prepared to do it. Because the values of our system are, uh, I say this over and over again, I don't care what church you go to, but the religion of this country is profit, it's money, it's the lowest price, it's the highest value on the stock market, it's the biggest quarterly profit. And when that's job one, everything else must suffer. And that's one of the problems we face. And that's why we discuss the uh, contract for uh, uh, the contract for rural and working America. Notice that restoring health care in rural America is number one. You know, if we don't have um, health care that covers 
everyone, it affects the stability of our nation. And that unhappiness index certainly is a good indicator of that. So once again, I'm going to ask you all to please share this. It makes a big difference. We have a second. Last Friday, we had almost a thousand people uh, view, and that makes a massive, massive difference as we move forward. Because the contract for rural and working America is something I'm proposing to the rest of the country. And there's a little bit of a secret to it, which is that if we take care of rural and working America, guess what? The rest of us are going to be okay as well. Those of you that live in the cities, you're going to find that uh, maybe your property values won't be quite so extreme. You know, those property values are great, I suppose, if you own the house, but what are you going to do with it? Sell it? Once you sell it, you'll never get back. So, and those that want to buy a house can't afford it. The, it's just become absolutely unaffordable in some of our states. Well, if we can rebuild rural America, and if we can pay workers what they, what they need to work to have a dignified life, to be able to have a life where they can get married, where they can get a home, where they can raise kids, where they can maybe send those kids off to higher education, where they can save for retirement, and maybe, oh, I don't know, buy a boat or go on vacation every so often. That's not asking too much. You know, I think most of America doesn't really care how wealthy the wealthy really are. I don't think they really care how much money Jeff Bezos has, even though it's an astonishing amount of money, and attempts to explain that are very, very difficult. But as long as we give people a dignified life, give them. As long as we give them what they deserve, we pay them what they deserve. And by the way, when we pay people more money, they will pay more in taxes, okay? So uh, I think uh, Jenna Quinn is saying lots of folks are soon going to be losing their homes. We have only begun to deal with the fallout of this. Now we've been through a meltdown in 2008. We bailed out the banks, we bailed out Wall Street, they were supposed to bail out uh, homeowners that were upside down on their loans, but they didn't. And that meant nearly 10 million people lost their homes in the years after that. And I think that's one reason we have Donald Trump. I think that that's one of the failures of our government was allowing that many people to lose their homes. We are going to be seeing that sort of thing again. Now, how many times do we need to learn this lesson? All this interest in trickle down that we've been told about for 40 years now, I think that's when I first started hearing about trickle down, it made sense. But we have tried it over and over and over and over again, over and over and over again. And it only seems to trickle down a little ways. And the money seems to keep collecting at the very top of the socioeconomic ladder. We need to do trickle up. We need to take care of people at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. And what will happen? They'll spend that money. If we put our focus there, they will spend that money. And maybe some banks will go out of business. Maybe some big corporations will go out of business. But if they are in business solely because of the support and the bailout of the federal government, maybe we need to reconsider that. You know, I have a neighbor who complains to me about socialism. But he gets very angry when I say, well, how do you feel about that $3 trillion bailout of Wall Street and the banks and the massive corporations? Well, that's not socialism. That's different. It's socialism, folks. So look, I hope I wasn't too angry. You know, I, I'm, I try to maintain my cool most of the time. Um, but uh, sometimes it makes sense. You know, the basic idea of this speech that I'm going to share with you all on Friday is that when you went on the play playground, you know, when I was little, uh, our backyard had a fence. Uh, it was actually a chain link fence because it was part of the school that our backyard kind of backed up onto. And we could see the playground from our backyard. We couldn't get there. but So I was five years old sitting with my brother Gordon, and we would watch the playground going on and uh, watch the kids playing. During the school, we couldn't go, but after school, my mom would take us, I think at a certain point, this was back in the late 50s, early 60s, we were allowed to go by ourselves, which hard to believe, you wouldn't, that wouldn't happen these days. We had slides and we had swings and had jungle gyms and all those were great, I loved the jungle gym. But the, uh, the seesaw was a special treat. 
And the seesaw was different because you had to work together and you, you, uh, you had to, you know, balance each other and you had to, had to cooperate. And so it was tremendous fun. And now there were good things and bad things that happened on the seesaw. And in this speech that I'll give you on Friday, I talk about how uh, the playground's been taken over by the bullies and they've done things to throw us off the seesaw, the slides, and the jungle gym, and the swings. And now it's time for us to get back on the playground and time for us to get back to cooperating and collaborating and doing what's right for the people of the country, to rebalance things between corporations and people. That'll be to all of our benefit, all of us, wealthy and poor. Let's uh, do what we can to rebuild the promise of America with liberty and justice for all. Anyway, that's all I'm thinking about right now. I'm a little bit impassioned about it. Let me give you a nice calming image. This is Dawn at the dock. I hope to see you all tomorrow. Thanks so much for being here. You know, I love you. Share this and uh, I'll look for you tomorrow. All right. Take care. Bye.